This is from John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The word of the Lord. Uh, Between Christmas and Easter of this year, we are turning our attention to the four Gospels and our Uh, particularly interested in the huge uh, number of characters, people whose lives interact or are engaged by the life of Jesus Christ and are therefore included in the story as told by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as we've seen, some of these characters uh, come on and off the stage very quickly. Uh, Their whole appearance is captured in just a couple sentences. Uh, Some appear in almost every episode in the four Gospels, like uh, Peter, James, and John, for instance. The particular character who interests us today makes three appearances in the Bible, all three of them in the Gospel according to John. In this first appearance, uh, the passage also contains uh, perhaps one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. In fact, Uh, If you watch football today, and I don't know why you would, but uh, you might see someone holding up in the end zone uh, this particular reference to John 3.16, and you would expect that because it's in the passage, I would make it the thrust of the sermon, but instead, I'm going to concentrate on the context in which that verse appears, and I really want to zoom in on the character. Uh, That's the theme of the whole series of the cast, and today I want to look with you at Nicodemus, the man who came by night. In this passage, uh, we also find a phrase that uh, has been picked up in the media ever since the time that uh, Jimmy Carter used it to identify himself. It is a phrase that uh, has often been misunderstood by uh, non-Christian people, 
and a phrase that has sometimes sadly been misused as kind of insider jargon uh, to churched people, and that is the phrase, born again. And so we hope uh, to see that phrase, uh, and it's not the only passage where it occurs in the Bible, but we hope to see the phrase as Jesus Christ first employed it, and then our hope is to sort of liberate it from the trappings it's accumulated through pop culture and through insider churchy jargon. And my hope is that if we can see this phrase, born again, in the original context, how Jesus Christ used it, that we may come away with a new understanding of the whole spiritual life, and uh, that might be a wonderful, uh, eye-opening experience for us. So let's look today, number one, the monitor, number two, the dialogue, and number three, three key words and what to do with them. Again, the monitor, the dialogue, and lastly, three key words and what to do with them. The passage begins in a kind of boring way, uh, a way that many, many stories begin. There was a man. And uh, even though it looks uh, boring and, and just incidental to nothing, uh, it actually is a link to the previous passage. And at the previous passage, the end of chapter 2, Jesus Christ is found in Jerusalem cleansing the temple. And what he's doing in that is standing against the establishment of the day, uh, which was very corrupt, and people knew that. And so the people saw him standing against the establishment and turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple. And the people sort of rallied around Jesus. And then in addition to that, Jesus Christ healed people and performed signs and wonders. And now the people want to hoist Jesus on their shoulders and make him king. But it says he would not entrust himself to them because he did not need any man to testify concerning him for he himself knew what was in a man. And then the next passage says, and there came a man. And John is trying to communicate to us, Jesus Christ knows what is in a man and there came a man and you better believe Jesus Christ knew what was in him. Even this important man, Jesus Christ can read what's in the heart of the man because Jesus knows what's in a man. And he knows this man, Nicodemus of the Pharisees. He is a man of the Pharisees. And you who are raised in church or who are Bible readers, you know that the Pharisees were the religious conservatives of the day. They were the fundamentalists. They were the forerunners of what we today call the Hasidic Jews. Uh, we still see them in the world today. The ultra-Orthodox, very serious about the law of Moses, very knowledgeable about the Hebrew Bible, very insistent that they were the keepers of the tradition of the rabbis, that they were charged with passing on the faith once delivered to the saints, that they were the monitors of everything good, true, and beautiful in the world. And we could add to that, while it's true that Jesus Christ did not rely on endorsements, Jesus Christ did not need any man to testify concerning him. He didn't need to be validated by people, but the same could not be said about the Pharisees. They really prized endorsements. It was really important to them what other people thought about them. The praise of men was something really precious to them. In fact, Matthew 23, that whole chapter will be devoted to how they love to get praise in the marketplace. You can imagine when a Pharisee walked up at a party. Did Pharisees have parties? I don't even know. But if a Pharisee walked up on a group of other Pharisees, that as he approached, all the other people having the conversation would scan him up and down to see that his hands were clean and that he was wearing just the right uniform that Pharisees are supposed to wear. They attached a lot of importance to appearance, to conformity with their little party, to being noticed, to being accepted but within their community. Endorsement. The praise of people was very important to them. And this man of the Pharisees, 
named Nicodemus, which, by the way, means conqueror of the people. This man, Nicodemus the conqueror, was a ruler of the Jews. And that's sort of code word for the fact that he was a member of the great council of Jerusalem, which was very similar to our Congress. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. So a very highly important man, highly credentialed man, a very highly respected man. The kind of man that if you were starting out with a new venture, you would really esteem his stamp of approval. And you would think Jesus would esteem his stamp of approval, but it turns out a little bit differently in this particular dialogue. And then lastly, we're told that Nicodemus came by night. Why is that important? Well, it could have been purely pragmatic because crowds were starting to gather around Jesus and it would be very difficult to get face time with him because so many people were always around him during the daytime. So perhaps Nicodemus was coming at night where he thought he might be able to have a private audience with him. Maybe, but I don't really think so. My guess, and I think a lot of uh, scholars would hold to this position, is that Nicodemus originally came by night, not to elude the crowds, but to elude the notice of his fellow Pharisees. John makes a notice of it twice. In the three appearances of Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, the first appearance we just read and the last appearance, both make note of the fact that Nicodemus came by night. Maybe Nicodemus was timid. His name means conqueror, but maybe that name you know, was a lot to bear, a lot to live up to. I always wonder about um, boys who, who are named Victor, means winner. And uh, boy, you better be a winner if your name is Victor. It's a lot, to, a lot to carry, that that kid has a lot of potential to live up to. And maybe Nicodemus felt the same way. In any case, I really do think this whole profile uh, fits together, that Nicodemus was a timid conqueror. There's a connection also with the last words in this particular dialogue, as Jesus talks about, people love the darkness, but those who come into the light uh, are a different story. And Nicodemus does seem to be coming out of the dark and into the light. Remember also, Nicodemus lived in this environment of spiritual peer pressure and fear, where there was always the possibility that a person might not be in step with the values and practices and beliefs of the group and therefore might be ostracized or even rejected. And in religious climates like that, where everyone is always monitoring you to see if you measure up, in those kind of spiritual environments, secrecy thrives. People commit their sins behind closed doors instead of out in the open. And sadly, that is very common among religious communities. And in fact, it's very common among all communities that harbor any beliefs. Could it be an atheistic society. If I was the leader of an atheist society and I got up in front of a group and I said, hey guys, you know, I'm thinking maybe there is a God. <laughs> that group would immediately get rid of me. And the same fear sometimes pervades spiritual communities and congregations. They start off vertical. They're all about the cause. They're all about God. But sometimes a subtle shift can take, a place, take place from the vertical to the horizontal. And I become less concerned about relating vertically to God and more concerned about relating horizontally to you to make sure you accept me and approve of me. It's really an a occupational hazard of being involved in a religious community. And the timid man, living in this kind of environment, afraid to be seen associating with this uncredentialed, hillbilly spiritual leader named Jesus of Nazareth, whom, by the way, 
Nicodemus addresses as rabbi. That would have been a very controversial thing because Jesus didn't have any credentials. He never sat under the feet of a great religious teacher. He never attended what we would call a seminary. And yet Nicodemus refers to him as rabbi. And Nicodemus had a lot to lose in stating that kind of opinion publicly. And so he's found in this initial appearance skulking about in the night. And yet, I think one of the great bright spots in this passage is that he is coming out of the night into the light that Jesus Christ is. The next time he shows up is in chapter 7 of the gospel according to John, and uh, it's a council meeting. Congress is in session. The Sanhedrin is in session. And what is the Sanhedrin discussing? They're discussing this fanatic from Nazareth. And they are proposing that they be rid of him, that they condemn him. And Nicodemus, sort of sitting on his hands as long as he can, and all of a sudden he just thrusts up his hand and says, wait a minute, doesn't our law guarantee that a person gets a fair trial before he gets condemned? And it says all the Pharisees turned on him in that moment. And someone blurts out in the crowd, hey, Nicodemus, what's up? You're not from Galilee too, are you? And everybody, I'm sure, laughed. And then it said they all went home. And then the third and final appearance of Nicodemus is after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Joseph of Arimathea bargains with Pilate for the body, and they remove the body from the cross, and Nicodemus shows up. He shows up not empty-handed, but he shows up with 75 pounds of fragrance and spice in order to embalm the body. And now Nicodemus is coming right out in the open in support of this Jesus of Nazareth with 75 pounds of fragrance and spice that can can no longer be hidden. And not only would that fragrance and spice be extremely expensive, it was also the agreed upon weight for the embalming of a king. And so in the end, Nicodemus heroically sort of steps out of the dark into the light in support of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, notice as we turn next to the dialogue, from the monitor to the dialogue, which is our second point. Notice that Nicodemus starts the dialogue sort of hiding behind his community. Rabbi, we know that you are from God. And the way Jesus responds is as if to say, did you say we know? Because I only see you. Where's the we? You know, in English, um, we only have one way to say you, and you don't know whether it means you plural or you individual. That's not the case in Spanish and many other languages. Um, The way we try to get around that in English is if you're from the South, you say y'all, And if you're from the north, you say, you guys. Or if you're from Pittsburgh, youns, right? But proper English has one word, you, and you don't know whether it refers to you plural or you singular, but not so in the Greek. Nicodemus says, we know that you're from God. And Jesus Christ answers, truly, truly, I say to you, singular, We're not talking about your community now. We're talking about you and me in dialogue. I say to you, timid conqueror, forget about being accepted by the we. Forget about speaking to the crowd. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. And another point that doesn't really come across in the English is that Nicodemus literally says, Rabbi, we see that you're from God. It's translated into our English as no, but the real Greek word is see, we perceive. We see that you're from God. And Jesus answers, truly I say to you, you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Jesus is saying you, singular, you, 
in your club that thinks it knows how God does his thing. You think you're the monitors. You think that you set the bar for what's good, true, and beautiful pertaining to God and spiritual things. You, timid conqueror, you, Nicodemus, you're so fixated on public opinion and the testimony of experts and you in your approval seekers club. You, Nicodemus, you think you see, but you don't see. You think you know, but you don't even see how the kingdom of God works. And you won't see that unless you're born again, born from above. And when Nicodemus hears being born again, he, he doesn't really get it, but he figures, well, you know, this is rabbi speaking, and meta- rabbis use that kind of wisdom talk, that kind of metaphorical language. And sort of nervously, he plays along, says, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born, can he? And Jesus goes on to explain the phrase born again. And Jesus, the rabbi, is always closing in on the man who came by night. And Jesus says, truly, truly, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And while scholars disagree on exactly what that meant, I think the context for me has convinced me what Jesus is saying is it is not adequate simply to be born of a woman, even if it's the right woman. You must be born from water, that is like the waters of birth. When a woman is ready to have a baby, someone will ask, has her water broken? We talk about the waters of birth. It is not adequate to be born from physical, the waters of birth from flesh. That doesn't qualify you to enter God's kingdom or enter God's beautiful reign. You need a spiritual birth. You need a second birth. And the thing is, with Nicodemus, if you had asked Nicodemus to explain the source of his spiritual confidence, if we had asked Nicodemus, hey, sir, could I just ask you, does God accept you as a person? Or what I really mean by that is, Nicodemus, if you were to stand before God when you die, and God were to ask you, Why should I allow you to come into my presence? Nicodemus, are you sure you'd go to heaven? And Nicodemus would have responded, I believe. How do I know I'm going to go to heaven? Because I'm a Jew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm one of the chosen people. My mother was Jewish. You can go down to the courthouse and look at the records. Oh, you'd follow up. So what you're saying, Nicodemus, is that God accepts you because of how you were born, because of your mother, because you have Abrahamic DNA. Yeah, I'm born of Jewish parents. And Jesus Christ is entering into that kind of spiritual understanding to say, no, it's not the first birth that gets you accepted by God. It's a second birth. Your mother can give birth to you physically, but to have life spiritually requires God the Spirit. Now, one little clarification, and then three key words, and then a little application, I'll let you go. Go to the table. The clarification is this. This is old stuff. I mean, this is 2,000-year-old literature written in a different language in a very different cultural situation, and it's difficult to understand what really is the thrust. And when anyone tries to understand ancient literature, try to decipher the meaning of it, try to come away with a big idea, one way is to look for clues. And one of the clues, which is good for us to examine, is the presence of key words. Words that are especially prominent in a passage or words that are often repeated in the passage. And in this particular text, I think we could light on at least three. First, first key word is the word born. It occurs eight times in the opening couple of verses. It's obviously the key word in the Greek language which John was writing, in which John was writing. The word is genao, from which we get our word generate. And it is always used in the passive voice. 
That is, the focus is never on something that you should do, but on something that is done to you. Or to get even more specific, when we think about being born again, if, if we tell people you have to go and generate some sort of spiritual experience, that misses the whole point. It's not something you do. It's something that's done to you. And the parallel between spiritual birth and physical birth shows how absurd it is to go tell people you have to go get born again. The parallel is, what did you do to get born the first time? I mean, would, would anyone here say, yeah, I remember I was just a single cell. <laughs> and these other cells were swimming by, and I grabbed one, and I made myself born. And for you parents who haven't had that talk with your kids yet, sorry to give it too much away there, but um, there's more to tell, by the way. Anyway, it misses the point to tell people, go make yourself born again. It's just not something that you do, but something that's done to you. Second, the word marvel. Jesus tells the teacher of Israel, why do you marvel? This whole teaching is found not only in nature, but in the scriptures, the scriptures you claim to know so well. Read the prophets, and the prophets will tell you again and again that there is an outward circumcision that is inadequate. You need also a circumcision of the heart. There is an outward birth, an outward connection in our DNA to Abraham, but that also is inadequate. An outward physical birth, but then it requires a spiritual birth that God must perform. So, teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, why do you act like you've never heard this? Why do you marvel as if it's unknown? And then Jesus says, in another sense, though, it is a marvel. Not in the sense that Nicodemus couldn't have found it in nature or in the Old Testament scriptures, but in the sense that it's marvelous. It's wonderful. It's a mystery. It's like the wind, says Jesus. We don't see where the wind originates, and we don't see where the wind terminates. We can hear it, and we can see the tops of the trees bending under its influence, but the wind isn't something we can generate, and the same thing in the spiritual realm. We can't generate our own spiritual life. It comes from above. God has to come down and bring life from heaven to earth. And Jesus Christ says, basically, and that's what I've come to do, to bring life from heaven to earth. And then a final key word, the word believe. It's used seven times in the latter part of the passage, obviously very important. In fact, somehow this whole dialogue is to move Nicodemus to the place where he believes. He came to Jesus firmly convinced that he was the monitor. He was the spiritual inspector for Jerusalem. He came to Jesus, the mighty Pharisee who could see. We see that you're from God. And Jesus is saying to him, eh, you think you see, but you don't. You think seeing is believing. But I'm here to tell you, Nicodemus, that believing is seeing. In other words, if you trust in me, if you believe, that is the certain sign that the Spirit has made you alive and that you're beginning to see the way God works. You're beginning to see the kingdom of God. And those who trust me, says Jesus, those who simply believe, they are the ones who see. They're the ones who start getting their questions answered. I know many people, in fact, some people probably here today, you think, if I could just get all my questions answered, then I could believe. But don't you see, it's really the opposite. If you could believe, then all of your questions would at least start to get answered. Those who trust in me come from darkness to light, from blindness to sight, those who believe. Now, for two conclusions, and then we'll be done. First, things that claim our confidence. 
things in which people put their hope, their trust. You know, Nicodemus had, had been conditioned by his community to put his confidence in the esteem of his peers. If people think highly of you, if you walk up to a crowd and they scan you, they monitor you up and down, and they give you the thumbs up, that must mean that you are a valuable, a good, a significant person. His confidence was in the opinion of his in-group. He was a Pharisee. He was an expert. He was a monitor. He was an inspector of all things spiritual. People looked up to him and thought, man, you know the senior superlatives in high school? Most likely to. Nicodemus won the award, most likely to succeed in the day of judgment. He had it all going on. And if people say that about you, you must be okay. He had all the symbols of success and rightness that his community affirmed in every way. And basically, he's now in an interview with God. God is sitting with him, and they're having coffee. He's having coffee with God incarnate. And he has the audacity to say, you know, Jesus, we think you might have a place in our organization. And Jesus is saying, I don't really care about your organization. I'm God incarnate in the flesh. And Jesus responds to him, and this is the official interpretation of the words truly, truly. What they really mean are, is quit fooling around. Every time you hear Jesus saying, truly, truly, you just put in the words, quit fooling around. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, quit fooling around. You don't even know what you're saying. It's not about having the right lineage, being born of the right mother. It's not about having the affirmation of people. It's about getting life from God. Nicodemus, you're putting your confidence in the wrong place. And, you know, I just want to say to our congregation, I know we have a lot of visitors here today, and this might not apply to you, but, but uh, to those of you who are in congregations like this on a regular basis, you know, religious groups and places of worship can very easily turn into recognition factories where people just go looking for a pat on the back, where we become a bunch of approval seekers, where the pastor comes every week to try to rally the base. But you know, it takes a supernatural act of God to turn a, an approval seeker like me. And I'm confessing to you, I really am an approval seeker naturally. But it takes a supernatural act of God to convince me, TJ, it really doesn't matter what they think about you. And it really doesn't even matter what you think about yourself. It only matters that you have life from God. Therefore, put your confidence in him who came to bring life from heaven to earth, the only begotten son that God gave to the world. Lastly, as C.S. Lewis said, Jesus Christ didn't come to make nice people. He came to raise the dead. And what I want to say is every person you've ever met, including you yourself, is in bad shape. I'm just telling you, the people around you today all dressed up in their nice clothes, those people have had hard weeks, have had heartache, have had heartbreak. They're in bad shape. You can count on that. And it's worse than you think. It's not only that we're in bad shape. Did you know that God told our first parents the day you leave me, the day you go out on your own and start depending not on me but on yourself, you shall surely die. In other words, we're all of us spiritually dead. That's why we need a second birth, a spiritual birth. And what do you tell dead people? I mean, do you, you tell them, well, if you just try a little harder, you'll come to life. You think that's going to work for a dead person? You think we want to really tell people, try harder. Get better education, get better habits, get better abs. And that might be great to have any of those things. But let's not fool ourselves. What we really need is life from God. 
We need the Spirit of God to blow over our dry bones and bring us to life, to be made spiritually alive and responsive to God. And Jesus Christ says, I came down in order to be lifted up. He makes reference to Moses. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Numbers 22, remember? The rebellious Israelites found their camp infested by venomous snakes. So many people were bitten by the snakes. People begin to get sick and die. Moses appeals to God. And God says, make a small figurine of the problem. Make a serpent out of bronze. Put it on a pole and lift it up. And tell the Israelites, whoever looks at the picture of the problem, the symbol of evil, will be healed. And Jesus Christ is saying, I am the fulfillment of that. I will become the picture of everything that's wrong with the human race. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become in him the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ is saying, I came down in order to be lifted up so that everyone who looks at me and sees the ultimate criminal, the ultimate lawbreaker that I will be reckoned to be on the cross will be healed. I will become the symbol of sin and I will be lifted up and put on display like a billboard, like the scapegoat. For Nicodemus, it didn't happen in one big bang, but I think you can read the three appearances and see that Something is happening here. Life is beginning to well up in him, and he is ceasing to be the know-it-all monitor that he once was. He's stepping out of the secrecy secrecy and, and pretension of his peer group, and he is stepping into the light. And in the end, when he shows up with those 75 pounds of spices, he was, I believe, a changed man. His deeds did not conform with the expectations of his peer group, but his deeds were manifested as having been wrought in God. He's not a conformist, but instead he becomes a hero. And that possibility is open to everyone who receives life from God. Let's pray together.